Hello, and uh, thank you for joining me today. I'm the last thing between you and the lunch, so I'll try to, to stay on time. It's always difficult something for me. So uh, we're going to talk about S-bombs today. And unless you've been living in a cave for the last three, four years, it's, it's hard to, to have escaped the hype around that. Um, quick word about me. I'm long time free and open source software uh, activist and uh, I build tools to figure out how we can make better use of uh, free and open source software more efficiently. Um, one of my claim to fame is I have my sign off on uh, one of the largest code deletion in the Linux kernel, except these were only commands. So trust me, it's a skill I'm very good at deleting commands. Uh, note that even though that sounds pretty trivial, we managed to crash the build of the kernel in doing so. We're cleaning up the licensing headers of the kernel, so I'm, I'm sure if some of you ever committed in the kernel, you're, you're probably thankful for this. Um, I'm also both French and American, which makes me for a very conflicted individual. Um, so, threat or menace, it's actually something that came in the 1968 edition of uh, Harvard Lampoon. It was a parody mm, magazine edition, parodying Life magazine. And they came out with this nonsensical sentence, flying saucers, are they a threat or menace? And if you, if you actually look at the, the next page, there's interesting drawings on the right, which looks very much like uh, some of the flying spaghetti monster uh, drawings. So there's probably some inspiration that came up there. Um, so wh wh where, where do we stand and where, why am I talking today? There's more and more open source software that we use to build application and systems. It's wonderful. We can do um, component-based development in a way. Except that along the way, uh, we now have routinely hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of software package from many different origins, which we assemble. And it's a mess. Uh, because, of course, it, we, we build software faster, but we, we also build bugs faster, and we create security issues and vulnerabilities also at a, a much faster rate. Um, and it's actually surprisingly difficult to figure out what is the software package that are used in any piece of software. Um, and that's true for every package. Now, I routinely see commercial packages, uh, commercial application systems that embed 10,000 packages. And when, when you have 10,000 packages, Excel doesn't really cut it anymore. It's difficult. And um, so it's, it's really problematic. Now, it doesn't look like a super bad idea to figure out what are the set of packages you use in your own code, right? And, and eventually passing the information along down to, to your users is, is probably a good thing. And if you think about it, when you reuse code from a third party, you want to know first, you know, is it okay to use it? What's the license? Very simply. And even though uh, most uh, free and open source software license are easy peasy, you still need to know which one it is because you may have different and varying policies. You want to know if you're using obviously non-vulnerable code, right? Um, that's, that's a problem otherwise. It's very obvious and, and something that's easy to avoid if possible. You want to know also whether you're using buggy or low quality code. And, and eventually, whether the project is alive, maintained, and sustainable in the long term, because all of these would be potential risk and, and eventually future vulnerabilities for, for your code base. So there, there comes software bill of materials. And so what are they? It, it stands for software bill of material. Bill of material is a very old concept that's used in manufacturing, where you, you put together the hierarchical list of uh, material and parts that you use to assemble some stuff. Like, say, a car can have tens of thousands of parts. And so it's it's well-known and travel um, discipline 
in uh, uh, the, the world of uh, real development of real products. Um, so the term was coined by uh, a guy in charge of, uh, it was working at CISA, so NTIA then CISA in the US. And um, actually, I think I, I had my slide switch, sorry. <laughs> That was the slide I was talking about. So, software bill of materials. Um, they've been coined by uh, uh, Alan Friedman. The idea is based on materials, uh, analogy, and, and of, of hierarchies of uh, parts and pieces used to build real products. And very simply, the idea is to say, let's build an inventory of all the software package I use to assemble a package. That's as simple as that. Uh, ideally, for it to be actionable and useful, you want to know the precise uh, provenance, uh, where the software comes from, what its name between quotes, and that's surprisingly difficult. And optionally, the licensing uh, for good measure. And eventually, it's designed to accompany every piece of software that you reuse or redistribute. And Going back, uh, <laughs> you've already seen that one, but uh, there, there's two interesting events that happened. One in May 2021, it was a bit prescient, where the executive order, an executive order was issued by the US government saying, if you do business uh, and software business with the federal government, then you will have to disclose every bit of third-party code used in your products. And they were giving 90 days uh, to actually, uh, 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 for, for providers of, of software to actually do that. And if you think about 90 days, that's, that's roughly six months before December 2021. Uh, unless you've been living in a cage, many people were, were actually in early, mid-December 2021 were pretty busy with uh, something called log for j or log for shell uh, And it was a mess just to figure out, are we using it, where it's being used, and then eventually how it's being used. Um, and nowadays, actually, it's still a mess. There's, there's roughly, uh, by certain estimation, up to 30% of the uh, downloads of uh, and use of log4j are still using vulnerable versions. And there's tons of reason for this. Um, a good buddy of mine works in a very large, uh, one of the three tier ones, a cloud uh, a company. And he was telling me that he was on vacations, recalled in, a, in a, an emergency to, to deal, and he was handling for them the, the log4j crisis. And in about a day, they had a solution to patch literally every single installation of every of their cloud customers for log4j. Um, and they decided not to do that, um, which was like, when we told this, I was like, are, are you guys full crazy nuts? It says, no, you, you see, we, we have banks, we have failed our customers, we have companies, if we start patching their own code without asking them for permission, that's the end of the world from a liability perspective for us. That's potentially the end of the world. So we can inform them, we can assist them, we cannot patch it for them. To this day, they, they are still about 30% of the customers which runs vulnerable version, if they, even though they, they know uh, very well that it's there. And so uh, the idea there is to say, if you have a way to know that, maybe it will help. Obviously, it doesn't fully help, but it may help a bit. In Europe, there's something else called the CRA, which is a, a pending, not really legislation. Well, it's a European legislation, but it's going to become a ruling, uh, which is a bit different from other European legislation in the sense that it will come into effect across all the countries when it's uh, voted in the Euro European Parliament. It won't be um, local adaptations that would be possible. And among the many things there is also to provide full disclosures of the software, third-party software that are used, eventually also down to uh, doing this for open source projects, um, with a few exceptions. So it's right now it's, the, the, it's, it's in the making, 
it's not the law of the land left yet, but it's going to become pretty soon. Um, uh, both of these mean that eventually uh, we were, uh, was trying to hide doing open source in a closet. Now they discovered us, and it's going to be much harder to figure out uh, and do things without providing disclosures on the, the kind of uh, uh, third-party software we use. So, uh, how do you make this software bill of material? It's an inventory of third-party package. So you can first very simply parse the package manifest, like a package.json, a, a requirements file, a, a gem file, to find out the list of, of packages that are used. You get essentially names and versions there. Um, you can parse install package database, an RPM database, for instance, if you have a, a virtual machine or a, a Docker image. You can also match, meaning find similar files to the ones you have in the code you analyze, um, which is akin to the known good process of, of matching files by checksum when you're trying to put aside, uh, uh, when you do forensics, the, the files that are known to have a good origin. You're trying to do the same, except uh, eventually on a slightly larger scale, because open source is reuse, remix, in many cases, it could be used just uh, pulled straight from Git repositories on a commit, so you may have a very large number of these. And because it's reuse and remix, you may want to find also approximate matches, which may not be exactly matching a checksum, but have a few, few modifications. Um, You can also collect this from the build. So you could instrument your build to figure out what is all the third party Maven package that are pulled at runtime, at build time, sorry. Or, uh, uh, what are all the Go package that are built and pulled from uh, various repositories? That could be one way. Or you can do reversing, meaning you look at the binaries and you're trying to figure out what are the corresponding source and third party package that went into that. It's actually, uh, slightly different from uh, uh, pure reverse engineering because you you may do that in a, a kind of white box control environment where you both have the source and the binaries and you're trying to figure out um, what is the subset of my source which are used to build my binaries and what is the set that is not part of my source that exists somewhere upstream and where it does come from. Um, now, there's many, many false, uh, free and open source software to do this. It's, uh, uh, there's a large number of, so of uh, startups and commercial companies in the field. There's been roughly about one and a half billion dollars of uh, venture funding thrown into the, the party over the last three years, which is like really mind boggling. Um, knowing what what you see as an output from these software companies, it, it's really mind boggling because it's, it's, it's sometimes a bit underwhelming. Um, so very simple workflow. If you think about it, you're trying to scan for packages. Um, you assemble this in some kind of document. We'll look at for a few in a, in a minute. Eventually you're trying to find a proper identifier for these packages. So you can look that up in the vulnerability database and at least at a high level, figure out, is there possibly a vulnerable package that may exist in my roster? It doesn't mean it's really vulnerable in the way you use it, but at least that's the, the principle. So let's look a bit how uh, um, SBOM looks like. So there are standards. There's competing standards. That's wonderful. Um, I, I'm actually one of the co-founder of uh, SPDX at the Linux Foundation. But I'm also very much involved with Cyclone DX, so it's not that I'm edging my bets. There's one that comes from, from a licensing, open source licensing and documentation perspective, which is SPDX. Cyclone DX is more rooted in security. And I'm involved with both initiatives. Uh, there's a lot of feud and bad bloods at times in them. Ignore the, 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 the discussions and the, the, the FUD, uh, it doesn't matter which one you use. Use both. If you have to, you likely will have. It's just a format. So uh, it's literally similar to a font. It doesn't really matter which font you're going to use to print something. What matters is, is the, the content. And actually, if we look 
at um, some example of what an S-bomb could look like. Uh, hmm. All right. So there's no escaping. There we go. No, no. Um, <laughs> is there some hidden? Ah, there's something hidden on the light on the side. Okay, we'll pretend it's mostly readable. So, so this is what is this? It's it's an SPDX JSON output visualized in uh, Firefox. Um, there's a bunch of headers. The, the thing that really matters is what you have at the bottom, the package URL, which basically says, uh, this is an entry for a Maven package called the uh, RX Java and its version. And that's essentially uh, enough to be able to understand where the code comes from, what it's download URL, and where you could get it. You, you have more to it, but that's the gist of it. It's an inventory, a list of packages. And, um, so if you look at Cyclone DX, that's going to be looking pretty much the same. Um, some headers and information about the, the, the package itself, its name and version. What's really important here is um, this ability to have actual name and versions that make sense across the board. Um, historically, vulnerability database the National Vulnerability Database in the US have been keyed by what's called CP, or Common Package or Platform Enumeration, which is something that's mind-bodingly complex and hard to relate to, to actual software that you use in practice. Um, it comes from a time when uh, people were mostly worried about uh, Adobe, Acrobat, and Windows and Microsoft Office vulnerabilities uh, dominated by commercial vendors when nowadays we use mostly open source package and, and CP are very not well designed for, for this kind of thing. Uh, there's this emerging standard which I'm very proud of because I started that called Perl or package URL which provides a, a, a better way to relate this and it's very obvious here that you have a Maven package. If you're software developers, you'll know exactly where to look for this package. Um, meaning that you have very low impedance mismatch between this and the volunteer database that would be keyed by this kind of identifier. Um, format wise, there's XML, JSON, and other. Um, the least common denominator that's easy to process by any tool is really based on, on JSON. So let's go back here, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, view, 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 slides, let's show. All right. So some, some of the problems. Question is whether it's exposing enough or too much information. Uh, there's a lot of objections that come mostly from commercial vendors says, oh, but it's exposing our secret source. It's going to make it super easy for attackers to figure out what, what the, the code we use and what are the known vulnerabilities. And, and frankly, I think this is BS because attackers are much more sophisticated than just needing a list to be able to do that and Red Team too. So uh, believing that you can do software security by obscurity is, is, uh, is probably not a good thing and doesn't help. Um, furthermore, there are so many tools that produce these. It's available as a built-in uh, within GitHub. GitLab is working on something. There's hundreds of tools that produce these uh, with various level of qualities, but eventually they'll come there. The point is that uh, it's... You ha it has to be treated as common knowledge. So the makeup of your application has to be treated as public common knowledge. Now the question is, is there too few details? And in earnest, uh, if I have hundreds of CVs and ten thousands of packages to process, uh, just knowing that there is one package that may be used in this application that may have this vulnerability uh, with a 
potentially not really well confirmed level of security, uh, or level of severity, it's not super useful. Uh, it's a start. Um, but if you think about having 10,000 issues to deal with, I'd like to be able to, to deal with 20 or, or 100. Um, and so uh, having information about, for instance, what is the commit in the open source package that introduce or fix the commit, the, the vulnerability is going to be much more useful than just knowing there's a vulnerable package. And being able to automate eventually if the code in the vulnerable package is reachable and used in your context is going to be also much more useful. Uh, just knowing there's a vulnerable package is at some level a bit of noise for many security team. I mean, it's, it's useful information and I wish, I'm, I'm sure many would wish that they had this information back in uh, uh, early December 2021, but it's not enough. Um, so there's, there's also an emerging standard called VEX and there's definitely a love for three letter acronyms in the security world, right? So one more, uh, the idea is to say an SBOM provide a static inventory, but you need to inform your users about which non vulnerabilities really apply in your context. And the idea of VEX is to provide a document that tells us that no, I'm using log4j 1, 2, 17, but no, I'm not vulnerable because this and this and that. That's the kind of statement we're trying to get there. Um, now there's another problem is that you have a bazillion of tools that are able to create this, but not many actually able to uh, uh, ingest and make sense of them. So if you're on the receiving end as a user, and eventually you will have your vendors or providers that start uh, sending this data, and you don't have the tools, you're not prepared, there's not a lot of these available, even as open source, that's going to be a problem. Um, when it comes to open source, if the CRA comes to uh, friction in some of the shapes we've seen, it could mean that every single open source project that has some relationship uh, from a distance with some commercial organization will have to produce this kind of inventory. And it's, it's going to be difficult because that's, you know, the, the, the fun, uh, the, the, sorry, the F for, uh, in compliance uh, with this kind of standards is for fun, really. So compliance is not super fun. It's really not the kind of things that open source software developers are signed up for. Um, and, and there's a problem of funding is uh, the beneficiaries are the users for software that's given as a gift. And who's going to pay for that? That's, that's a problem. So um, pretty much it. So in conclusion, uh, it's going to be an imperative that's, that's emerging. Eventually, it's going to become a mandate. So there's no escaping from that. It's no more, no less than just a, a list of the software package you use in your package. By the way, if you're building security tools that are open source or not open source, you will have the same need. So when I say every software, it's really every piece of software. Um, and there's a long way to go to track these packages. Um, I, I'm offering services to, to help companies figure out what's in their code. And there's not a single case where the product team knows exactly what's in their code. It's, it's a bit all over the map. And there's a long way to go to get something there. Standards, you know, schmandards. Just use them both, ignore the feud. Uh, they're just formats. Um, but there's definitely going to be these two standards, Cyclone DX and SPDX, that are going to stay there for the long run. Um, they're, I think, really great tool for defense. But, you know, if you're on the offense side, use them. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, rather than trying to figure out from the outside what could be possible software vulnerabilities that exist if you already have the makeup um, and you know which version and which non vulnerabilities exist, that's, that's a wonderful tool for the attack side too. And still a lot of work to make use of this at scale. And um, there's one serious problem is that we, we really need better vulnerability data. And let me put just one slide there. 
Um, there's a lot of vulnerability database out there. Historically, the national vulnerability database, but um, you now have a project from Google called OSV. Uh, GitHub provides its own feed. Uh, GitLab and every single commercial vendors has their own database of vulnerabilities. I don't think vendors, commercial companies, are really willing to to solve the issue there, um, because they're they're always claiming to have a bigger bigger database, bigger D. Um, the problem is that um, they're both expensive to buy, and generally the quality of these is poor. I have countless examples of made-up vulnerable package versions. Um, which is a problem, or uh, made-up packages. So if you say package foobar is vulnerable to this, but this package doesn't exist anywhere, that's not a big deal. But it's it's pretty shattering in terms of confidence to know that you have uh, high-quality commercial solutions which provide crappy data. And um, uh, so I think there's something to be done there. Um, the, the process of review and curation of vulnerabilities uh, at the national national volunteer database in the U.S. with with MITRE and NTI, I don't think it's a process that scales. Uh, the process is also being spread around what's called CNAs, uh, CV numbering authorities, and uh, I don't think it scales either. So e eventually, there's a need to do something at the community level, uh, involving all the security professionals and software developers that create these bugs, so we can provide better ways to report them and cure them. There's a lot of bogus issues. There was a recent um, issue reported as being super high vulnerability uh, on curl CRL, which happened to be a, a total uh, waste of time um, and a bogus vulnerability. But on the receiving end, if you're a secure organization, you have hundreds of these coming up and you see, oh, CURL 9.8, I need to do that. Let me reach out to curl. What are you doing with these vulnerabilities? And they were basically on, on the open source side swamped by request to fix a bug that doesn't exist. So there's, there's a real problem there. Um, there's also a problem which is to finish, I think, a lot of the uh, commercial vendors that sell vulnerability database are telling you that they, they have premium vulnerabilities, which are zero days that nobody has access to, which are not in national database, not available publicly. And what's the difference between that and selling vulnerabilities uh, on the dark side? So th there's really a, an ethical problem, which is uh, retaining premium vulnerability information is no different than selling it for profit. Uh, for exploit, and and we we need to find a way to break this kind of logjam. And that's pretty much. It. I don't know if you have any question. All right, so we're done. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful lunch.